All right, today we're talking about non-covalent forces. These are forces that hold molecules together but are not covalent bonds. And before we start talking about non-covalent forces, I want to recall something that we talked about previously, and that is electronegativity. Electronegativity, if we can spell it right, electronegativity is a topic that you learn a lot about in general chemistry, and it comes back again and again here in organic chemistry. And so let's just make a dumb little periodic table over here on the right side of just some approximate electronegativity values. So we'll have hydrogen, which is electronegativity of approximately 2.1, lithium, sodium, potassium. And so we have low electronegativities along the left side of the periodic table. So lithium is 1.0, sodium is 0 0.9, potassium is approximately 0 0.8. And then if we move across the periodic table with some elements that we commonly see in organic chemistry, we have things like boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, then chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And I probably should leave a little bit more room for these guys here to write their values. So boron is 2.0, carbon 2.5, nitrogen 3.0, oxygen 3.4, fluorine 4.0. So we kind of increase as we move over to the right and then we start going down in electron electronegativity as we go down again. So 3.2 for chlorine, 3.0 for bromine, and 2.7 for iodine. These are all approximate values. <clears throat> now if you have a bond between two atoms there is an electronegativity difference that you can calculate for that bond. So if electronegativity difference is less than 0 0.5, we call that a covalent bond. So for example, if we take a look at the bond between carbon and hydrogen, the electronegativity of carbon is approximately 2.5 minus the electronegativity of hydrogen, which is 2.1. Notice that this, this sign right here is a bond, and this is actually a minus sign, so don't get it twisted there. And then if we do that subtraction, we get 0 0.4. So the electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen is 0 0.4, which means that the bond between carbon and hydrogen would be classified as a covalent bond. If the electronegativity difference is between 0 0.5, including 0 0.5, up to 1.7, we are going to call that a polar covalent bond. So for example, Let's take a look at the bond between carbon and oxygen. And it doesn't matter if it's a single bond, double bond, triple bond, we still do the same subtraction. So let's see at the difference between carbon-oxygen and a carbon-oxygen double bond. Carbon's value is 2.5 and oxygen's value is 3.4. So if we do that subtraction, we get negative 0 0.9. Okay, and just we're looking for the difference as the absolute value. So if you get a negative number, just make it positive. And 0 0.9 is between 0 0.5 and 1.7. So therefore, carbon and oxygen form a covalent bond, but specifically a polar covalent bond. And so we can actually draw what this might look like using something called a dipole arrow. And the dipole arrow is an arrow that points in a polar covalent bond towards the more electronegative atom. That is the atom that has the higher electronegativity value. In this case, it's oxygen. So just draw a little arrow. And I usually draw these arrows in red, but you can draw them in any arrow you want, any color you want. And then just one other feature, the arrow has a little line through it. And this is to make sure that it doesn't get confused with other types of arrows, like for example, the resonance arrow. 
So it's, a, it's an arrow with a little plus sign on the other side to show that the carbon is more electropositive. So it's actually kind of like a plus sign. And this arrow indicates what's called induction. An induction just refers to this uneven sharing of electron density. The oxygen is more electronegative, so it's pulling more electron density away from the carbon. There's another convention to show induction. And you could show that as a uh, partial charge. So if we draw our carbon-oxygen bond again, I can put a little Greek delta which looks like a little musical note, kind of, and put a plus sign to show it's delta plus, and another delta on the auction, delta minus, to show that there's a partial negative charge. So this little delta symbol equals partial charge. And that partial charge is due to induction. So you might be wondering, I thought we were going to be talking about non-covalent forces. This is very much a covalent force, and that's actually completely correct. So we are still talking about covalent bonds here. Uh, but this property of covalent bonds called induction, specifically to polar covalent bonds, is going to be important when we get to the next slide. Okay, now there's one other thing that we do need to mention, and that is what happens if the electronegativity is greater than 1.7? And we're going to call that an ionic bond. So, for example, sodium hydroxide. Sodium has an electronegativity of 0 0.9. And oxygen, which is what's being electrostatically attracted to the sodium since it has a negative charge, has an electronegativity of 3.4. We do that subtraction and we get negative 2.5. 2.5 is greater than 1.7, so this is an ionic bond. So these are some arbitrary distinctions that we are making classifying these different types of bonds. In reality, the line between covalent, polar covalent, and ionic is more of a spectrum rather than these hard and fast ranges. So every bond some lies somewhere along the spectrum of polar, covalent, covalent, and ionic. So you can the, the more accurate way to think about it is this. You have covalent on one side of the spectrum and ionic on the other. And then somewhere in the middle, you have polar covalent. And then depending on the bond, you have different ranges along the spectrum. So for example, a carbon-carbon bond would be purely covalent. Carbon-hydrogen bond, a little bit more polar covalent. Nitrogen-hydrogen bond, a little bit more polar still. Carbon-oxygen, a little bit more. Lithium carbon, a little bit more. Lithium nitrogen, now we're really getting into ionic territory. And then you have things that are almost purely ionic, like NaCl. So this is the more reality picture. This is a spectrum of polarity, bond polarity, and not these hard ranges. OK, but we're going to use the hard ranges in this class, because that just makes it easier. So let's take a look at an example exam style question that I could ask you about this page. Let's take a look at the next page and for an exam example. Example. The question might say, identify polar covalent bonds and show partial charges. Okay, and let me draw a molecule for you to do that on. So here we go. I'll draw it as a Lewis structure instead of a bond line structure just so that we can see all the bonds more clearly. Okay, so here's the molecule. Let's try and identify the polar covalent bonds. So what we need to do is look at every single bond and look at the electronegativity difference between the atoms that are connected. 
So we already saw that carbon and hydrogen on the previous page had an electronegativity difference of 0 0.4, which is less than 0 0.5. So that means all these carbon-hydrogen bonds are just regular covalent bonds. They're not polar covalent bonds. We saw on the previous page that carbon and oxygen has a bond difference of 0 0.9. So this would be a polar covalent bond. So I'll draw a little arrow pointing to that bond, showing that we're identifying that as polar covalent. And then what about oxygen and hydrogen? Well, if you recall, uh, oxygen had an electronegativity of 3.4 minus hydrogen, which is 2.1. So that's an electronegativity difference of 1.3. That is within our polar covalent range, since it's greater than 0 0.5, but less than uh, 1.7. So we're gonna go ahead and identify that as a polar covalent bond as well. And now we just need to draw our partial charges. So what we can see is that we have bond polarity moving towards the oxygen on both, on both sides. The carbon-oxygen bond is polarized towards oxygen, and the oxygen-hydrogen bond is polarized towards oxygen as well. And the reason for that is that oxygen is the more electronegative atom. Now we can draw our partial charges. So the hydrogen would have a delta plus, the oxygen would have a delta minus, and the carbon would have delta plus. So that would be the answer to that question. Let's do another one. Let's see if we can word it a little bit differently. Okay. Regions which are delta plus, so that means partially positively charged, are likely to be attacked by anions like hydroxide. And that makes sense, right? Anions, which have a negative charge, are going to be attracted to positive or partial positive charges. So the question is going to say, identify two carbon atoms most likely to be attacked by hydroxide. Okay, let me draw a molecule. I'll do a bond line drawing this time. Okay, there's a nice bond line drawing. And what we want to do is identify polar covalent bonds. Because remember, wherever there are polar covalent bonds, there are going to be partial charges. So we can see right here we have a carbon-oxygen bond, and we know that that's a polar covalent bond. Oxygen has a delta minus. Carbon has a delta plus. And if you look over here, we have a chlorine-carbon bond. Chlorine has, if you look on the previous page, an electronegativity of 3.2. And... Carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5, so that is going to be a difference of 1.3, which is definitely in the polar covalent range. And so that means chlorine will have a delta negative, and carbon will have a delta plus. So we've identified two carbons with delta pluses, so let's go ahead and circle those. This carbon right here would be attacked by hydroxide, and this carbon here, attached to the chlorine, would also be attacked by, attacked by hydroxide. So being able to identify polar covalent bonds is so, so important because in organic chemistry, we are going to be able to identify the regions of a molecule that are likely to undergo a chemical reaction. So that's, that's key. Okay, now polarity can be quantified. And so this is a little bit of math, but you won't ever actually have to do this. But you can calculate something called the dipole moment. And the dipole moment, and you don't need to know this, I'll never ask you this question, is signified by the symbol mu, which looks like a U with a long line in it. It's a Greek letter. And this dipole moment is calculated using the following formula. Delta times D. 
and what do these things mean? So the delta symbol is the partial charge, and the D is the distance separating the charges. So this makes sense. Polarity is the degree of charge times the distance between the charges. So if you have charges that are really strong and really separated, that would be a strong dipole moment. But if you have charges that are not so strong and pretty close together, then that's gonna be a relatively low dipole moment. And so one of the most important things that chemists have done in terms of um, organic chemistry reactions is calculate the dipole moment for various solvents. Remember that chemical reactions usually occur inside some sort of solvent. And by adjusting the solvent, you can adjust the dipole moment of the solvent. And that can actually impact reactivity. So we'll see later in this class that the choice of solvent can make a big difference. Let's take a look at a table here to show what some common organic solvents are and what their associated dipole moments are. And again, you don't need to know any of this. This is just for reference purposes. And so you'll always be able to view this table. And so you can see here that the greater the dipole moment, the more polar that solvent is. So you can see something like acetone is an extremely polar solvent with a dipole moment of 2.69 versus something like carbon tetrachloride that has a dipole moment of zero. So that would be considered a totally nonpolar solvent. So let's take a look at what's going on here and why these different solvents have such different dipole moments. So let's just focus on two solvents for now. Let's focus on chloromethane and carbon tetrachloride because they're actually very similar, but they have big difference in electronegativity value. So chloromethane, and I promise we are gonna talk about non-covalent interactions. Uh, we're just having to do the background for this. Okay, so let's take a look at the structure of chloromethane. Chloromethane has the formula CH3Cl. So we've got a carbon in the middle, and there are three hydrogens attached, and one chlorine. So if you draw the dipole arrow for this solvent, you'll see that it points towards the chlorine and there's that little plus sign on the carbon. And so this has that dipole moment of 1.87. Okay, so they did the math, they did the partial charge times the distance, which had to do with the bond length between carbon and chlorine, and they calculated that to be 1.87 Debye, which is what that big D stands for. Now let's take a look at carbon tetrachloride. So that's CCL4, carbon in the middle, chlorine, 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 chlorine. So now it's all chlorines attached to the carbon. And take a look, if we draw the dipole arrows, there's four of them. So it's not that this molecule doesn't have dipoles. In fact, it has four dipoles. It's just that all the dipoles cancel out because they're all facing in opposite directions with equal intensity. That's why the dipole moment is zero. In other words, there's no net dipole moment. If you add up all the dipole moments, you get nothing. So we'll just say dipoles all cancel. No net dipole moment. So that leads us into another question that I could ask is not just identifying all the polar covalent bonds, but also drawing the net dipole moment for a given molecule. Let's take a look at some examples of that. Okay, so let's see, example. All right, draw the net dipole moment for the following compounds. So draw net dipole moments. Okay, compound number one looks like this. Compound number two. And compound number three coming right up. Okay, let's start by just drawing all the individual dipoles, which are along polar covalent bonds. And we know we've seen already that carbon and chlorine forms a polar covalent bond. So we just draw these little dipole arrows parallel to the 
polar bonds themselves. And we can see that the first molecule has two dipole arrows, uh, both facing towards the chlorine. So if we added up those arrows together, like if, as if we were going to combine those two arrows, what you'll see is that one is pointing up and to the left and one is pointing up and to the right. The left-right motion is going to cancel, but we have a net dipole moment pushing upward. So I'll draw the net dipole with a green arrow showing that the net dipole in this molecule is pushing up. For molecule number two, we have a dipole moving down and to the left, another dipole moving up and to the right. In this case, the up and down and left and right will all cancel and we'll have a net dipole of zero. So the dipole, individual dipoles cancel, so the net dipole is zero. And then for our last molecule, we have a dipole moment going down and to the left, dipole moment going up and to the left, and so the up and down is going to cancel, but the left movement will be preserved. So if we add those vectors together, we get dipole motion to the left, like that. So the green arrow is representing the net dipole moment. Okay. So now that we've talked about that, we get to talk about the intermolecular forces. These are the non-covalent interactions that I wanted to talk about since the beginning of this lecture. And we are going to be talking now about the forces that hold molecules together that are not covalent bonds. So in other words, these are the attractive forces between molecules. Okay, and there's actually three of them that we're going to learn in this class. The first is called dipole-dipole interaction. The second is called hydrogen bonding. You may have heard of some of these before. And the third is called fleeting dipole-dipole interactions. So number one, let's talk about these dipole-dipole interactions. Okay. And so what this is about is that if you have polar molecule, so let's say for example we have some molecules of acetone, and we saw that acetone is a pretty polar molecule, it's actually an organic solvent that's pretty polar. We saw it on the previous page on that table. And so the oxygen has a partial negative charge and the carbon has a partial positive charge. Remember that a positive and a negative attract. So what happens is if you have a lot of acetone molecules together, they are going to organize in a way that they can put their negatives and positives close together. So they kind of form what looks like a conga line. They all line up. And they all line up so that there's delta plus, delta minus delta plus, delta minus, delta plus, delta minus. The dipoles are aligning with each other and so there is an attractive interaction between the different molecules. Now these are not covalent bonds. These interactions are pretty easy to break, but there is something there. It's not nothing. There is an electrostatic attraction. So molecules align with each other forming that molecular conga line. And so this has a big impact on some physical properties. Let's do a little comparison here. So let's compare the physical properties of acetone versus isobutylene. Isobutylene is basically acetone without the oxygen. It just has a carbon there. So if you look at the melting point, so I'll abbreviate that MP and boiling point, we'll abbreviate that BP, the melting point of acetone is pretty low, negative 94.9 degrees Celsius. And the boiling point of acetone is 56.3 degrees Celsius. Okay, sounds reasonable. 
What about isobutylene? Well, the melting point and boiling point of isobutylene is much lower. The melting point of isobutylene is all the way down to negative 140.3 degrees Celsius. And the boiling point of isobutylene is also lower. It's down to negative 6.9 degrees Celsius. So these, you can see these molecules are very similar. One has an oxygen, one has a carbon, yet they have boiling point, melting point differences of like 50 degrees. Why? The dipole-dipole interactions hold the acetone molecules together. So if you have a stronger dipole-dipole interaction like you do with acetone, because acetone has a stronger polarization, acetone has that delta minus and the delta plus versus isobutylene, which lacks that, that means a greater dipole moment equals a higher boiling point and melting point. And that makes sense because in order for something to boil, you have to break the, uh, the molecules apart so that they can enter the gas phase. If the molecules are stuck together like glue, it's going to take a lot more thermal energy to separate those molecules into a gas. Same thing can be said by turning a solid into a liquid. To break the solid lattice, you have to apply more energy to overcome those forces. To turn it into a liquid. So looking at the melting point and boiling point of a compound is a really good way to determine how strong its dipole-dipole interactions are. All right, let's take a look at the second form of intermolecular force, and that is hydrogen bonding. Now, hydrogen bonding is really just a subset of dipole-dipole interactions. And we'll take a look at some pictures to show why this is the case. Now, but when we, before we talk about hydrogen bonding, we need to make a distinction. There are what we call hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors. So a hydrogen bond donor is a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom. An electronegative atom is usually oxygen or nitrogen. For the purposes of this class. Can also be something like fluorine. And then the hydrogen bond acceptor that's going to be defined as an electronegative atom, period. And the only thing is that it has to have a lone pair. So the electronegative atom, which is usually oxygen or nitrogen, with a lone pair. So it's actually the lone pair themselves that is the acceptor. Not the atom, but the lone pairs themselves. So let's take a look at an example of a hydrogen bond donor acceptor situation here. So one of the most common examples would be that of water, hydrogen bonding to itself. So here is a molecule of water, and here is another molecule of water. And we'll just put them kind of near each other. And I'm going to draw the lone pairs on this second water molecule. And I'll draw these lone pairs in their sp3 orbitals that they're in. And what you can see is happening here is that this oxygen 
has a delta negative, and this hydrogen has a delta plus, and then these lone pairs in the oxygen have a delta negative because there are electrons. And now there is a hydrogen bonding interaction between the hydrogen and the lone pair of the oxygen. It's essentially a dipole-dipole interaction, just like on the previous page, where we have a positive and a negative becoming attracted to each other. This is really no different. The only thing that's different about this is that we're talking specifically about hydrogen doing this. Let's take a look at another example. We can see we can have ammonia. And ammonia can hydrogen bond with itself. Okay, we have one molecule of ammonia acting as the donor and another molecule of ammonia acting as the acceptor. We can draw some partial charges, delta minus on the nitrogen, delta plus on the hydrogen, delta minus on this other nitrogen. And then we can see there's this hydrogen bonding interaction between the hydrogen of one molecule of ammonia and the lone pair of another. So why do we make this distinction if this is just really a subset of dipole-dipole interactions? The reason is that these interactions are quite strong. Why are they strong? The reason is H is small. The hydrogen atom itself is small, so the partial charges can get very close to each other. That makes the interaction quite a bit stronger. Let's take a look at an example of how this manifests as a physical property. Let's take a molecule of ethanol versus a molecule of dimethyl ether. Now, the first molecule of ethanol has a boiling point equal to 78.4 degrees Celsius whereas the dimethyl ether has a boiling point equal to negative 23 degrees. Okay. Why such a big difference? Well, ethanol, the first molecule, has a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom. So that means the first molecule has hydrogen bonding. The second molecule, dimethyl ether, does not have an H attached to an electronegative atom. So there, that means there is no hydrogen bonding. So you can see that there is a massive difference in boiling point as a result of that. The more hydrogen bonding you have, the higher the boiling point is going to be for the same reasons as the dipole-dipole interactions. The hydrogen bonds hold the molecules together. So if you have a lot of hydrogen bonding, it's going to take a lot of thermal energy to break those hydrogen bonds to cause a phase to change. If you don't have any hydrogen bonding, then you don't have those strong hydrogen bonding interactions, and so it's easier to break the molecules up so they boil at a lower temperature. All right, now let's just talk about the final form of um, intermolecular force, and that is the fleeting dipole-dipole interactions. These are sometimes called London dispersion forces, or LDFs. So these are called fleeting dipole dipole interaction. So let's take a look at uh, some examples of some molecules first and see their changes in boiling point. So let's take butane and it has a boiling point of about exactly zero degrees Celsius. Now let's take hexane. Actually let's take pentane first. It has a boiling point equal to 36 degrees. And then let's take hexane. That has a boiling point equal to 69 degrees. 
okay, why is these boiling points going up? There's no polar bonds and there's no hydrogen bonds. So there's no dipole-dipole interactions. There is no hydrogen bonding interactions. So what intermolecular interaction is responsible for this increase in boiling point? Well, let's take a look for a second. If you draw a molecule of pentane, draw it here, surrounding the pentane are those electrons that are forming all the bonds with all the hydrogens, with all the carbons. There's tons of carbons and hydrogens in pentane and they all have bonds and inside of those bonds are electrons. So let's just highlight those electrons in yellow and that yellow glow is an electron cloud. So we'll just call that yellow glow an electron cloud and I'll label that. There's an electron cloud around that molecule. Now let's say another molecule gets close. So let's say another molecule of pentane gets close to it. And it also has an electron cloud. Okay. Now look what happens. The electron cloud is negatively charged. The electron cloud is negatively charged. So what happens is this electron cloud gets close to this molecule and starts to push electrons towards the other side. It does what's called an induced dipole. because The electrons get close and it starts to push the electrons away onto the other side. So what is that going to do? Well, when that happens, it's going to start to create a deficiency of electrons on this side because it's pushing the electrons away onto the other side. So delta plus, delta plus, delta plus, and then the other side starts to get a little bit delta minus. So this is, a, this is an induced dipole. Electrons get close, push electrons away because electrons are repelled by each other, and then that creates, for a split second, a bit of polarization inside of that molecule. Now look what happens. Because there's a delta plus and a delta minus, there can become an interaction between these two molecules. So now we have the two molecules still close to each other. And we have our delta plus, delta plus, delta plus, our delta minus, delta minus, delta minus. But because now this side is electron deficient, the electrons in this molecule start moving over to this side to get close to them. So now this side of the second molecule becomes delta minus. And of course, if the electrons move to the left side, molecules on the right side, the electrons on the right side are going to kind of leave, and that's going to create a delta plus on that side. And so you can see that we are starting to create a dipole-dipole interaction now between these two molecules, even though there was never any polar bonds to begin with. It was a dipole that was induced by the moving another molecule close to it because the electrons repel each other and then they become attracted to the charge difference. So we're going to call this interaction a transient dipole-dipole interaction. And these are also called London dispersion forces. And these are a pretty weak interaction. These are a pretty weak interaction compared to the true dipole-dipole interactions or the hydrogen bonding interactions. The net result is though, is that the larger the molecule, the more surface area it has, the more surface area a molecule has, the stronger this interaction can potentially be. So larger molecule equals larger surface area. equals stronger LDFs. Okay, but something to keep in mind here is that because this is due to surface area, branched molecules will actually have less surface area because they're more compact, which means that branching can reduce surface area.
Let's take a look at an example of how branching can affect surface area, thus resulting in the LDFs becoming weaker and thus causing the boiling point to go down. So let's compare, for example, this molecule versus this molecule. Now, both of these molecules have the same molecular formula. They both have the formula C5H12. You can draw in all the hydrogens and prove that yourself. But the branching is different. In the first molecule, there's no branching at all. It's completely linear. And the boiling point of this is, as we saw above, 36 degrees Celsius. However, this next molecule, which is the exact same chemical formula, but more branching is more compact. So it has reduced surface area. So the boiling point of this molecule is 28 degrees Celsius. So you can really see that by reducing the surface area, the LDFs also reduce and therefore the boiling point goes down because the LDFs which are holding these molecules together become weaker and so it's easier to say boil these molecules and undergo a phase change. Now, one last thing I want to mention about these three intermolecular forces, if we go back to this slide here. I will ask you to rank molecules based on their boiling points. So I'll have you look at like three molecules and I'll have you decide which one of these molecules has the highest boiling point. And what you're going to have to look at is which molecule either has the highest dipole-dipole interaction, meaning the greatest polarity of the bonds, uh, which molecule has the most hydrogen bonding, meaning the most number of hydrogen bond donors or acceptors, or the greatest fleeting dipole-dipole interactions, which would mean the greatest surface area, which means lower branching, more atoms. But I will not ask you to compare multiple factors simultaneously. In other words, I won't ask you to decide what's going to have a greater influence fleeting fleeting dipole interactions or hydrogen bonding. So I won't give you a molecule that has a ton of surface area but no hydrogen bonding versus another molecule which has very low surface area but tons of hydrogen bonding and expect you to predict these competing factors how they will play out. So I will make you make comparisons but only within uh, agreeing trends. So in other words, I won't borrow, ask you to compare competing trends. Okay, so just keep that in mind and look forward to some practice problems on uh, today's quiz and also on the problem set and also during our live hours. Okay, that's it for now.